Hello! Beyond All Reason is a free-to-play open-source RTS. It features big team battles with thousands of units, huge robots and impressive explosions. It also provides a solid offline experience with capable AI and a variety of maps. There are also smaller scale matches like 1v1 or 4v4, but personally I mostly play 8v8s and this guide will focus on them. Intention of this video is to help you understand Beyond Horizon. I will explain basic concepts like resource generation and spending, as it's a bit different than in other known RTS. I will talk about basic units and buildings so you know when to use them. I don't want to give you a specific build orders which you have to follow because I believe that doing things without understanding why will do you no good. I will give you an example of opening but it's by no means ideal, it's just something that works for me. Feel free to tweak it to fit your playstyle. Beyond Horizon is very dynamic from the very first minute so you just have to know how to adapt. Of course, you can min-max everything like any other RTS, but as a beginner you shouldn't worry about it. It's worth mentioning that Beyond Horizon is basically a remaster of Total Annihilation. So, if you are familiar with it or with games like Supreme Commander or Planetary Annihilation, then you should learn it very quickly. It is not available on Steam yet, so you have to download it from the official website, which I will link in the description. I encourage you to check out the guide section on this website because it is very well done and covers a lot of topics, ranging from basic controls and economy to advanced mechanics like radar stealth or special self-destruct effects. At start, I advise you to head out to single player and play a skirmish against AI to figure out the basics. When the match starts, the first thing I'd like you to do is to open the settings. Make sure that you select Advanced in the upper right and open the Controls tab. Enable Grid Optimized Keybinds. The advantage of Grid menu is that it groups your building menu into four categories so it's easier to find what you need. Of course, if you don't like it, then you can just switch back to default. In the Interface tab, enable Always Show Prices, Idle Builders, Factory Dock, Energy Converter Usage and Widget Selector Interface. Switch to the second page of the interface tab and enable Reclaim Field Highlight and Building Grid. Always Show Prices means that the cost of the units and buildings will be always displayed. Idle Builders show you all of your idle builders at the bottom of the screen. Factory Dog gives you a button on the right side where you can quickly add something to the factory building queue. Building Grid just show you a grid when you build something so it's easier to organize your base. I will talk about energy conversion, reclaim and widgets later. You start the match with a single unit, the commander. You will use him to build up your base and to defend against early aggression. Commander has access to the D-Gun which one-shots everything but has rather low range and costs a lot of energy. Commander can also cloak which makes him invisible. Cloak also costs energy to maintain and the cost is even higher when you are moving, so make sure to not overuse it in the early stages of the match. We'll talk more about energy later. Commander also has the ability to capture enemies. It has a very niche use because you have to get close and it takes some time, but you can capture any unit and building, including enemy commanders. Commander can also move underwater. It allows you to build basic naval buildings, but it also means that you can use him to secure islands or sneakily reach the enemy base and degun all of it. The standard win condition is to kill all enemy commanders. Most of the time the match ends earlier when the losing team realizes that there is no hope and they just resign. Note that hiding your last commander in the lost match is against the rules as it basically wastes time of everyone involved, so just don't do it. At the moment there are two factions which you can choose, Armada and Cortex. They have different units but in the broad view they are somewhat similar. I literally never played Cortex so I will just show Armada in this guide. You can choose the faction in the lobby or right after the match starts. There are three resources which you use to build your base and units. Metal, Energy and Build Power. Metal and Energy are displayed on top of your screen. Metal is the whitish bar and energy is yellow. 
You can see your income and spending of corresponding resources on the left of the bars. Number in the middle indicates what is your current stock and on the right you can see your maximum storage. If you get more resources than you can store, the excess will be shared with your teammates. If everyone is full, then the resource will be wasted. Most of the time you want to avoid overflowing your resources. But if you are rich and you want to help out your teammates, you can use red sliders on the resource bars. All resources above the sliders will be shared with your team. The basic way of obtaining metal is building metal extractors or maxes on the metal spots. Metal spots are marked on the map with a circus and a number. The number indicates how much metal per second you get when you build an extractor. You can build only one extractor per spot. Claiming the metal spots is very important as metal is the most limited resource. The team with more of it can quickly get ahead of their opponents. There are often high value metal spots in the middle of the map which you want to capture or at least deny from your opponents. Another way of obtaining metal is energy conversion. You can build energy converters which transform energy into metal. These are the foundation of the late game economy because you can just keep building them as long as you have space and energy to do so. If you take a look at the energy bar, you will see the energy conversion slider. All energy above the slider will be used by energy converters. The energy converter usage option, which I asked you to enable earlier, will show you how many of your converters are actually used. If it sits at 100%, then you probably should add some more. If it's much lower, then you probably build too many of them. The last way of obtaining metal is reclaim. You can use your commander, constructors or specialized units to reclaim everything you built to get all of the metal back. Energy is lost, but it's not a big deal later on. Some maps also have various features which you can reclaim for metal and energy, like trees, rocks and so on. Furthermore, when stuff gets destroyed, it leaves a wreckage, which you can also reclaim to get some of the metal back. Securing wrecks or reclaim fields is a crucial part of the game. If you send an attack which won't achieve much, you basically donate metal to your opponents, as they can just reclaim leftovers of your units. It's very important to plan ahead and prepare some reclaiming units to follow your push. That way you will be able to get the metal for yourself while enemies deal with your attack. It's also worth noting that there is an overkill mechanic. If your damage is much higher than target's HP, then it won't leave the wreck. You can also destroy leftovers by attacking it with your units to prevent your enemies from reclaiming them. I mentioned that you can use the degun of your commander to instantly kill enemies. It leaves no wrecks, so if you can kill them with regular means, then you shouldn't use the gun. No reason to waste free metal. Let's move on to the energy. The most basic ways of obtaining energy are solar panels and wind turbines. The solar panels have constant energy output of 20, but they cost quite a lot of metal. Wind turbines are cheaper and most of the time they are more cost efficient. However, the energy output depends on the wind speed, which depends on the map. It also fluctuates throughout the match. Wind speed is displayed on top of your screen near the resources. If you hover over it, it will show you the average speed for the current map. The wind speed equals the energy generated by a wind turbine. So 10 wind means that one wind turbine will produce 10 energy. Many maps have trees or something similar which you can reclaim for energy. These are often the best sources of energy in the early game. Other energy sources which you get access to pretty early are geothermal power plant and tidal generators. Geothermals can be placed only in a special spot marked with green circles. They aren't present on every map. They are extremely cost efficient, so as with high value metal spots, they are worth fighting for. Tidal generators are built in the water. Their energy output depends on the tidal speed of the map. Unlike wind, it is constant throughout the match. Tidal speed is displayed near the wind speed. Similar to wind, then tidal speed means that a tidal generator will produce 10 energy. 
they are often more cost efficient than solar panels. By cost efficient, I mean how much energy they produce per metal spent. With all that said, solar panels might sound like a bad choice, but they have their advantages. Firstly, there are maps with very bad winds, so we just don't have any other option. Secondly, solar panels are much more tanky. You can easily lose your wind turbines to single unit, while solars can take some beating. It's especially important on the front line, where your base is more exposed. Thirdly, they are just reliable. The wind speeds sometimes drop in the worst possible moment. With solars, you don't have that problem. Solar panels also don't cost any energy. So if you have a big energy crisis, for example because wind speed dropped, and you have spare metal, then you can quickly build some solar panels to get through rough times. Remember, you can always reclaim them later to get all of the metal back. It will be faster than trying to build something while you have zero energy. This brings us to the topic of build power and how the building works in Beyond Horizon. In games like Starcraft or Age of Empires, you have to get your resources first. Then you pay the cost up front and then you wait until production is finished. And you can cancel it to get the resources back, but you waste the time you spend waiting. In Beyond Horizon it works differently. You don't have to gather resources before you start the production. When you build something, you slowly put the resources into it. When you put all of the required resources, then the construction is complete. The rate at which resources are fed into the project is determined by the build power. The more build power you have, the faster resources go in. Of course, your resource generation has to keep up with the resource spending. There is no point in being able to spend 1000 metal per second if you produce only 10. On the other hand, producing times that metal while you can spend only 10 is also a bad thing, but although not as bad as the other way around. Ability to balance your build power and resource generation is a core skill which you have to practice to get good at the game. When you stop the production in the unit factory, you get the metal back instantly, but energy is wasted. In the case of buildings, if you stop building them, they will slowly decay, losing metal in the process. The decay starts after a few seconds, so you can freely switch your focus for a while without losing anything. It's a very useful in situations I described before. If you run out of energy while producing something, you can quickly build a solar panel to get an energy boost. And if you want to cancel the building without wasting metal, you have to reclaim it. Let me give you an example of how build power affects production. The bot lab which produces units has 100 build power. You can check it in the bottom left corner where the unit stats are displayed. If you hover over the unit which you want to build and press I, you will see the detailed cost. Now that shortcut will be different if you don't use grid keybinds. Apart from the metal and energy cost, you can see the green number. It's a total build power required to complete the construction. For example, the construction bot requires around 3400 build power. The bot lab provides 100 build power per second, so it will take around 34 seconds to build the construction bot. And you will steadily pay the cost over that period. It's quite a lot of time, so you have to speed it up. Your commander has 300 build power and you can order him to guard the lab with the right click. It will make him help the lab with every unit it produces. Now you have 400 combined build power so you can produce your construction bot in only 8 seconds. Construction bot has 80 build power so if you order it to assist the bot lab it nearly doubles its base build speed. Now that you can right click the lab or the unit which is being produced. If you right click the unit, you won't automatically assist the next one. The assisting mechanic is the reason why you are not supposed to build multiple labs in the beginning. Increasing the speed of a single lab by assisting is much cheaper than building additional ones. Later in the match you will add additional labs. There is a maximum speed at which you can produce units determined by how fast they are able to walk out of the factory. 
If you are building units at maximum speed and still don't spend all of your resources, then it's time to add additional laps. It's also worth mentioning that after building a few construction units, you should start building construction turrets. These are buildings with 200 build power and big range which they use to assist your construction projects automatically. They are the most cost effective source of build power, so you should add more and more of them as you scale up your production. But keep in mind that it's very easy to overbuild them, as they cost quite a lot of metal. You don't want to spend all your metal on contourets because then you won't have any left to build your units. Ideally, your metal spending should be just a bit higher than the metal income. That way you are actually spending your resources but without tying too much of it into unnecessary build power. As a rule of thumb, if you run out of meta while building a construction turret, then it wasn't needed at this moment. You build them to spend your metal faster, but if you have no metal then you don't need to speed up anything. Don't be scared to back off and reclaim or at least stop building unnecessary construction turrets or any other building, even if it's halfway done. Running out of resources while you build something is called stalling. You want to avoid it at all costs because it basically means that you try to bite off more than you can chew. If you are stalling on the metal, you should focus on one project and reclaim things that you don't need. Let's say you stop producing units while you build. Reclaim the lab. You are not using it and you can quickly rebuild it later. Maybe you are building with 5 constructors. Reclaim a few of them. If you have no metal, then you don't need this build power anyways. You have to remember that nothing you build is permanent and you can and should reclaim and rebuild things as you need it. It's much faster to reclaim the building, finish the current project and rebuild it than to just wait for resources to come. As for stalling on energy, there is a high chance that some of your teammates are in a better spot energy-wise, so just ask for help. Unlike metal, energy is something that you often have excess of, so people are much more willing to share it. Just make sure that you have energy storage so that they can give you a meaningful amount. I will talk about details of resource sharing later. Ok, I think it's enough about basic resources, just a few more words about storage. If you rely on wind as an energy source, then you should build energy storage. It will ease the pain when the wind drops. As for metal storage, it's useful when you get sudden influx of metal, for example from a big reclaim field or when you reclaim a costly building. If you have a big late game economy, you should always have some additional storage. Sometimes you will micro your units and meanwhile you will forget to queue up something in your base and your resources will pile up. It's better to have some buffer to store it. In general, piling up resources for a while is not as bad as in other games because with enough build power you can quickly spend it all. Alright, enough about resources for now, I will get back to the late game economy later. The way the matches of Beyond Horizon play out make it pretty difficult to talk about specific build orders. They depend on the maps because you might have different amounts of resources available, there might be specific terrain features which promote specific units and so on. You also have to react to what enemies are doing because if you are building up your early economy while they are rushing units you will have a really bad time. I'd like to go over basic units and building first to give you an idea what you have available and then I will give you an example build which works for me. You don't have to follow it exactly, but I guess it's better to have some starting point. Let's start with the buildings available to your commander. I already talked about every economic building which your commander has access to, so let's start with the combat tab. You have a light laser turret, which is your main means of defense early on. An anti-air tower, which can stop very early air aggression. And torpedo launchers, which you can use to defend against naval units. Know that torpedoes cannot hit hovercrafts. In the utility tab you have a radar. It marks enemies in its range with dots, allowing your units to shoot them without actually seeing them. You will notice that the dots move around all the time, it's because radar is inaccurate and it shows only rough locations. Because of that you still need a line of sight to guarantee accurate fire. 
You can improve the precision of radar, but I will talk about it later. Another important thing is that radar can be blocked by terrain. When you place it, it will show you an actual area it covers, so make sure to build it in such a way that it covers what you want. Radars are pretty cheap, so if it will get you good coverage from your base, then don't hesitate to put it there. You can always build another one closer to the front line. The naval variant of the radar also has sonar. Sonar allows you to detect underwater units like submarines, amphibious tanks or commanders. Beholder just gives you a vision. It's very useful because it has a cloak and a stealth, so it's invisible and it does not appear on the radar. It means that enemies can find it only if they walk into it or if they saw you building it. It's also very small, so you can build it almost everywhere, including step cliffs. Getting this up early in the area which you know will fall into enemy control can give you a huge advantage. They won't be able to hide their forces, so you'll be free to bombard them with accurate long range fire. Just keep in mind that cloaking costs some energy, so you might not be able to afford too many of these very early in the match. The Dragon Steve are basically a wall. They prevent units from passing through and block the shots of some of them. The height plays a big role in there, for example light lasers are taller than the wall so they can shoot over it. Some of the units are so small that they cannot. I won't go over details there because it's a rather lengthy topic, just don't be surprised if you see that some units shoot over it and some don't. It's also worth mentioning that late game units can just go right through it so don't depend on this later on. In the build tab you have various construction buildings for specific unit types, boats, vehicles, air and so on. Let's talk about them now. There are a few unit types you can start with, but the boats and vehicles are the most common. Boats are cheap and can traverse hilly terrain more easily, but they are generally slow and don't have that much HP. They are weaker than vehicles in head-on battle, but due to their cost you can mass produce them much quicker. Swarming bots is a solid tactic because of the flanking mechanic. If you attack a target from multiple sides, you deal up to two times more damage. Another reason is the friendly fire. Units with AoE don't care about their team and they will happily kill each other while shooting at your bots. Vehicles are generally faster and stronger than bots, but they are also more expensive and less maneuverable. They also have access to long-range artillery, which can take care of static defenses. The big tank push can be very scary because if it manages to get past your defenses, you might have a huge problem cleaning it up. I see vehicles used all the time because their higher range and speed allows you to control the battlefield more easily, at least in early stages of the match. Other units types are aircrafts, which are more of a support role. Bombers can totally wipe the enemy team, but a air player will most likely prevent that. Playing air often comes down to playing defense while massing fighters just to be sure that the enemy doesn't have more than you. On the maps with the sea, you will get access to ships. Control of the water is very important because late game ships have very long range, so they can easily wipe whole bases across the shore. Sea players also have access to strong anti-air ships. It allows them to deny a portion of the map from enemy air player, making it easier to perform a successful bombing run. Overcrafts are special units which can move over the water. They are pretty weak for their cost, but they can attack from unexpected angles, which makes them a great harassing tool. Seaplanes are other water-specific units. They are just slightly stronger version of Tier 1 air. Seaplanes and hovercrafts are both good options to further influence the game if you have already taken control of the sea and the shores with your navy. As a beginner, you should be mostly concerned with boats and vehicles, so let's talk about them now. I might make a separate air guide later, as it's also something which I played a lot. As I said in the beginning, I will cover only Armada, but as far as basic units go, Cortex has a very similar counterparts. Starting with the bot lab. Constructor bot builds more advanced structures than the commander, such as stronger turrets, advanced solar panels and jammers, which prevent your units from peering on the radar. It can also reclaim and repair, but there are better options for that. 
In the beginning, you should get some of them to assist your lab to speed up production. I will talk about the buildings which constructor bots have access to when I finish with the units. Lazarus is a dedicated reclaim and repair bot. It's much faster than a construction bot, so it can reach reclaim fields much quicker. It's also stealthy, which means that it's not appearing on the radar. Lazarus also has the ability to resurrect Rex. It costs only energy, so you should always try to resurrect high value units and buildings. You can use multiple resurrection bots to speed up the process. Pawn is a cheap and fast assault bot. Pawns are very weak on their own, but in big numbers they can be very deadly. Because of their low HP, it's very easy to overkill them, which means that when you attack with them, you leave very little metal behind. They are especially strong when you make use of flanking mechanics. Around 10 pawns is enough to kill a lone commander if you manage to surround him. Tig is the cheapest and fastest bot you can make. Tigs are scouts, so they are very weak in combat, but have a long line of sight. Although their damage is low, it's enough to kill maxes, construction bots and so on. It's always good to have a few of them to provide a line of sight for your higher range units as many of them have longer range than the line of sight. Tigs are also the main way of harassing enemies at the start of the match. Killing their maxes cuts their metal income and forces them to spend time rebuilding them. Rocketeers are long range bots which excel at destroying stationary and slow moving targets. They slightly outrange light laser turrets so you can use them to push back the turret wall of your enemy. They are very vulnerable when rushed by quick units so you should always have some static defenses or army to fall back to. They have longer range and line of sight so you should supplement them with ticks for the vision. You can also make use of a set target command which will make them shoot at a marked spot. It's very useful if you know that enemy units or buildings are somewhere but you don't have a line of sight. Now that Rocketeers are unable to shoot over other units so you should keep them in line. Otherwise the ones in the back won't shoot. You can put units in any formation just by dragging with the right click. Maze is a solid well-rounded bot. It can take some beating, it deals solid damage and outranges commanders. If you want to mass produce something, then mices are an okay choice, especially if you manage to keep them healthy with repairs. However, they are slow. If anything gets spots them, you won't have any chance of catching up. They also have much lower range than many commonly used units. It means that most of the time you end up on the receiving end of harassment, which might get quite annoying, especially if you are against someone using vehicles. In general, Maces push paid with smart usage of res bots can be very powerful, but it requires quite a lot of micro. Centurions are the most expensive tier 1 bots, but it doesn't mean they are the best. Centurions are strong, but they are even slower than Maces and have lower range. It means that it's very easy to kite or go around them. They are also very costly, so before you'll be able to mass produce them, there might be higher T units in play already. Personally, I experimented with making one Centurion as one of my first units. If you repair him, there is nothing which can really deal with him apart from the D-Gun, but it's quite micro heavy, so I don't really recommend that for a beginner. In short, they work on a very specific scenario, so don't mass produce them blindly. And the last unit in tier 1 bot lab is the crossbow, which is an anti-air unit. Honestly, I rarely make this, because most of the time static AA is not. However, if we have an early push going, it might be worth adding a few of these to stop enemy air from countering you. As for vehicles. Construction vehicles serve the same role as bot counterpart, but it's faster, more expensive and has a bit more build power. Groundhogs can lay mines which are amazing defense tool to cover your flanks. Just make sure to spread them out to prevent them from chain reacting. Blitz is a very fast tank which makes him extremely deadly if you manage to bypass enemy defenses. It doesn't fare well in head-on fights though, so don't try to hold the front with them. Rover is a scout, just like a tick but stronger, faster and more expensive. Stout is your main assault vehicle. It is very tanky, has solid DPS and is much faster than bots. If you are not sure what you should produce, then Stout is the answer. 
Just keep in mind that they cost a lot of metal, so losing them on the enemy side might result in a big metal donation. Janus is a rocket tank with a huge burst and a noticeable AoE. However, it has a low rate of fire, so it requires some micro to get the most of it. You don't want to waste your shots on weak units and you don't want to blow yourself up. They are very useful because if you have few of them you can easily kill enemy units with each salvo. Shell Shocker is your basic artillery unit. It outranges every tier 1 defense apart from static artillery. You want to have a few of them on the front line to harass the enemy defense line. Just keep an eye on them because they are pretty slow, so it's easy to rush them. The Beaver is just a construction vehicle, but it can move underwater and it can build naval buildings like tidal generators. Pincer is an amphibious tank. You can use its ability to move underwater for a surprise attack, but in other situations stout is just better. And the last one, the Whistler. It's a missile truck with very low DPS but big range and line of sight similar to the scout unit. It can also attack air targets. It might be very annoying to deal with because it can tickle you from a long distance. It's useful to have this around to provide vision for other units. Those were all basic units. Let's talk about buildings you can make with T1 constructors now. They get access to more advanced economy buildings like geothermals and advanced solar collectors. I already mentioned geothermal, so let's talk about advanced solars. They are just more cost effective versions of solar collectors, but they cost a lot of energy, so you won't be able to build them too early. The wind turbines are still more cost effective metal wise if the wind is good, but if you go for the reliability or your wind farm got blown up and you don't have time to rebuild, the advanced solar panels are the way to go. There is also the Armada specific stealthy cloaked mechs, the Twilight. Similarly to the Beholder, being stealthy and cloaked means it's completely invisible to enemies and they will find it only if they walk over it. Personally, I never found a use for it. Most of the time I'm just able to secure the mechs or it's so close to the front that I won't be able to build it anyways. The neat feature of the twilight is that if you self-destruct it, it will stun everything around it. But still, it's a very niche use and I never used it. In the combat tab there are a bunch of stronger defensive structures. The beamer has the highest single target DPS and it outranges every bot. If the enemy makes rocketeers, beamers will counter them nicely. Overwatch outranges every basic unit apart from vehicle artillery. It's great at stopping whistlers from tickling you with their rocket, but it's very weak against swarms of units. For example, 10 ticks will easily kill a lone Overwatch. Dragon's Claw is an interesting one. It's stealthy, so it won't appear on the radar and for your enemy it looks like a wall. It shoots lightning which zaps to nearby enemies, so it's pretty good at killing swarms. It's also a pop-up turret. It hides while it's not shooting and while hidden it takes much less damage. It makes it very resistant to artillery because if you keep repairing it, there is no way for them to break it. I like to put a bunch of single walls around it to make it hard for the opponent to notice where exactly it is located. You also have two more anti-air options, ferret and chainsaw. Don't build ferrets as they are just terrible. Four needles will do a much better job and they will still be cheaper. Chainsaw is also a good choice if you can afford it as it has a very high range. In fact, it has a higher range than late game flak cannon, which is the default late game anti-air weapon. And the last but not least, the gauntlet. It's static artillery which outranges every basic unit. It's very costly, so you have to be able to defend it as the enemies might rush you the moment you start shelling them. Gauntlet is mostly used to stop enemy artillery vehicles from shooting you and to deny the ground. You can switch it to high trajectory if you have no clear line of fire. It's also worth mentioning that like the other plasma weapons, it gets higher range if it's built on the high ground. Moving on to the utility tab. There are two additions. The Jammer which creates an area which is hidden from radar and the Juno. Jammer is rather self-explanatory, but keep in mind that it costs a lot of energy. There is a very high chance that you will stall on energy when you build it 
and if you have no energy then your laser turrets cannot shoot, so be wary of that. Juno is a counter to raiders and jammers. When you build it, it will slowly generate a stockpile of rockets. It has unlimited range, so build it somewhere safe in your base. When you order it to attack, it will launch a rocket which will destroy every jammer and radar in a big area, including ticks and rovers. Furthermore, for 30 seconds, all ticks and rovers will be killed when they enter the area. It means that you can immediately rebuild your radars and jammers, but you should forget about ticks. Now that Juno does not overkill your stuff, so you can resurrect your buildings and units. Later in the game you might be constantly bombarded with it, so it's worth having a few resurrection bots with resurrection order on repeat near your jammer. Also keep in mind that your Juno will also kill your units, so be careful where you aim. Alright, the last tab and we are done with the buildings. On the build tab you will have a construction turret, which I mentioned earlier, is the most cost efficient source of build power and you should add them as you expand your economy. You also get access to tier 2 factory. Bots will have the bot lab, vehicles, the vehicle plant and so on. Overcrafts are a bit unique as they can build both the T2 vehicle plants and the shipyard. They also have access to the seaplane platform. Tier 2 factory produces stronger units and tier 2 constructor which you can use to build up the late game economy. Ok, now that you know the basic buildings and units, we can talk about roles in the team. When you load up into the match, the first thing you do is choose your starting location. At this point you can still choose your faction at the bottom of the screen. Most of the time the starting positions are well established and they are the places with multiple metal spots near each other. If you are not sure where to start, then just ask your team to mark the spots. The spot in which you play determines your role. If you pick a forward position, you are frontline. Most of the time they are multiple frontline players and sometimes there is only the frontline. As a frontliner your job is to prevent any harassment from enemies, secure high value positions in the middle of the map and to harass opposing bases. You should focus on making units and take up only if you can afford it without leaving the front defenseless. In my opinion is the best role for the beginners. There is more action, you don't have to worry about high tier units at least in the beginning and you have to worry only about your neighbors. Also if your base gets blown up to pieces you can leave the game without crippling your team and hop into the next one. Of course rebuilding is more helpful to the team but I think no one should expect beginner to do so. I will talk about some ways to get back into the game later. If you pick a spot somewhere in the back you don't have to focus on units so much. It leaves you a room to get a better economy, faster tech up or to go for the air. At the first glance it might seem like a more relaxed experience, but playing backline comes with greater responsibility. You have to respond to what is going on on the map and help your team where needed, all while not falling behind enemy backliners. It requires some game knowledge and that's why I don't recommend it to new players. Trying to learn the backline on the fly might be a miserable experience for you and for your team, so I advise you to go watch some replays or spectate more experienced players first, just to get a general idea of what they do. For example, one player is supposed to get the tier 2 lab as soon as possible and produce T2 constructors for his teammates. If you don't know how to get to the T2 lab quickly, then you set your whole team behind. It's also worth mentioning that in the backline there should be only one player who focuses on economy and one who focuses on air. Echo player is supposed to just scale up his economy to the point where he can just overwhelm enemies with the amount of stuff he can produce. Air player is supposed to scout and make fighters to protect from bombing crans and of course bomb enemies if possible. If you have multiple Echo or Air players, you might run into the problem where you don't have enough ground army to protect your bases. That's why one of each should be enough, at least at the start of the match. You should also keep in mind that on some map there is no backline. In such cases everyone has to cover the section of the front. That's why you should just ask the team if you are not sure about the position on particular map. Ok, time for example opening. Let's say you play as frontliner on all that glitters. 
you will have four players in front and four players behind them. As a frontliner, you are supposed to set up the defensive line in the middle of the map. There are higher value metal spots in there and you want to secure them. The front is quite wide and it's nowhere near your base. It means that it is quite easy to sneak a few units past it early on. It can cause a lot of chaos because it forces you to divert your attention. So the early goals are to get some quick units like ticks or overs as a response for enemy harassment and to move your commander to the middle of the map. Having your commander on the front line is extremely important because he can build basic defenses and deal with low tier units himself. He can also repair your units. Repair is free so it increases their value dramatically. At the start every unit counts so keeping them alive is very helpful as it allows you to build up your army faster and it allows your units to get more experience which in turn increases their max HP and DPS. Alright, so you know the rough plan. Time to build up the base. The most generic build order is 2 maxes, 1 solar, 3rd max, another solar, lab and 2 more solars. The reasoning is, you want to get your closest maxes as soon as possible to get the metal going. Then you need around 60 energy income to build the lab without draining too much energy. As I said before, wind turbines might be more efficient there, but it depends on current wind and sometimes it drops hard in early game. As a frontliner I prefer reliable opening, so I go with the solars. I build a solar after the second max because sometimes you stall on energy before you finish the third max. It mostly depends on how close to each other they are. When the lab is complete, regardless if you play bots or vehicles, you should queue up two scouts. Move them to the front line to get as much vision as possible. That will be your early warning if enemies try to sneak some units in. Remember, as a front line you have to take care of such leaks and you can't do anything about them if you don't see them. Meanwhile, use your commander to build two more solar panels. Personally, I always play bots, I don't have much to say about vehicles. From what I saw, people tend to make a mix of Staus, Artillery and Janus. Artillery harasses static defense and stationary units, Janus burns down anything that gets too close and Staus just protect them from any aggression. So, let's assume you will go for the bots. After scouts are done, you have to increase your build power, so queue up one construction bot to assist your lab. Meanwhile, your commander builds the two solars which I mentioned earlier and he assists production of the construction bot when he's done. When the con bot is ready, it's time for your commander to move to the front. Now you run into an issue. You have to switch focus between front and your base. Luckily, you can somewhat automate the production in your base and you should use the time before you reach the front to set it up. You have to steadily expand your build power and energy production while keeping the constant flow of variety of units to the front. You can achieve that with the repeat option of your lab, auto groups and the ability to insert something into front of the build queue. So if I queue up 3 pawns and 1 Lazarus and enable repeat they will get produced constantly until I clear the queue manually or disable repeat. You can insert something in front of the build queue by queuing it up while holding ALT. Units added that way will be ignored by the repeat function. It's a great feature which allows you to set up your lab once and then just produce specific units when needed. The auto grouping feature allows you to make use of your units without switching your attention to the ready point. If you select a unit and press ALT plus number, then all existing and newly built units of this type will be automatically added to the group. You can add multiple unit types to the same auto group, but I don't use it too often. To remove a unit from the auto group, select the unit and press ALT plus tilde. The auto groups persist between matches, but you can disable this behavior in the settings. So, let's say I want to focus on making pawns, but I want to have a few ticks and rest bots too. I also want to have a bunch of rocketeers early and I also want to still increase my build power. That's what I do. I already produced two ticks to scout the front line and a con to assist the lab. I need more build power so I queue up one construction bot first. Then I queue up five pawns, one Lazarus and one tick and enable repeat on my lab. Make sure to enable it before construction bot is finished because you want to keep building them too. Now I said that I want to have a few rocketeers, let's say 6. I will hold ALT and queue up them. 
I will be built after the construction bot and then the lab will go back to what I set up in the first place. Now that constructors won't move to the rally point, they assist the lab by default. You can disable this in the settings. If I see enemies attacking, I will cancel whatever I'm doing and prepare the response. If they come with the scouts, I will just make scouts myself. If there are some actual fighting units, I will immediately produce a few pawns or a beamer to protect my base. If there is no aggression, then I can continue with my plan. You can select the construction bot while it's building and give him orders before he is finished. You need to expand your energy production, so queue up a bunch of wins. I like to always order cons to guard the lab as a last order in case I forgot about them. And that way they won't stay idle. You can queue up orders by holding shift. At this point I should talk about various base building tricks. You can rotate your buildings with square brackets or with your mouse. The mouse way is a bit odd but that's how it goes. Select the building, hold the right click, then hold left click and move your mouse. The building will rotate in the direction of your mouse. Then release the left click and the building will be placed. If you want to build your windmills, you can hold shift and drag to queue up a line. If you hold shift and alt, you can queue up a box. Before you make a huge box of windmills, you should know that buildings explode when destroyed. If you bunch up all of them, they will chain explode when attacked. It's a wet dream of any air player because he could send one bomber to destroy your whole energy production. In the case of wind turbines, make only two per row. If you build three, they will all blow up. You can also just spread out your buildings. So hold shift and alt, draw the box and then press Z or X. For the windmills, even the smallest spacing will stop them from chaining. At this point I should also mention that energy converters go out with a big explosion. Never build them next to the other buildings or we just make it easier for enemies to blow you up. If you hold space while choosing the building location it will show you the explosion radius. You can also see it on existing buildings and units. Just select them and hold space plus X. The blinking radius is the self-destruct range and non-blinking is the explosion radius on death. Space has another important use. If you hold it while giving any command to the unit, this command will be put on top of the queue. It's the same as alt clicking in the factory. I use it all the time, for example if I'm building something with my commander and I want to quickly assist the lab without breaking my order queue. Furthermore, if you press N, you will move to the next order in the queue. For example, I am assisting the lab, but I ran out of energy. I have spare metal, so I built a solar panel. I will hold space to put the building of the solar panel in front of the queue. Now, commander will start building it. And I will press N to get back to assisting the lab when my energy has built up. You can quickly juggle a few tasks using the shortcuts, which allows you to easily react to changing wind speed and so on. Ok, let's get back to our example game. Your second constructor will build winds and your unit production will start. When you notice that you have a lot of energy, you should add energy storage. It's very important to have plenty of it in case you will have to dig an enemy army or cloak your commander. Just don't build the storage while you have no energy. Also, remember to use auto groups to make it easier to control your units. Meanwhile, your commander is reaching the front. You should build a radar somewhere along the way to see if enemies are not doing anything sneaky. Other than that, you want to get there fast and start building light laser turrets to secure your part of the front line. It's important to not stop at every max on the way. If you delay your arrival at the front, it might be much harder to secure it if your enemy got there first. It's because the enemy commander might just dig on your turrets while you build them. At this point I should mention that commanders are immune to the gun and they can body block it. So when you build your turrets, you should stand in front of them to protect them from being degunned. Ok, now you have a commander near the front line building static defenses and securing maxes and the constant stream of units coming from the base. As for the constructors which we start to pile up at your lab, you should send at least one of them towards the front and claim maxes which you miss with your commander. When it reaches the front, it should start building advanced defenses like beamers and dragon claws. Assist him with the commander to get them up faster. 
I think that having around 5 constructors at the base is enough so you can stop producing them around that number. In general, don't stress too much about min-maxing constructor usage. Even if you forgot to queue up something, you can catch up pretty quickly because the resources will limit you anyways. You also should add two or three construction threads to prepare for taking up to tier 2 technology. At this point, the time of build orders has ended. Now you will have to use your knowledge of available units and buildings and react to the situation on the fly. Keep an eye on your allies. If someone is pushing hard, make sure he won't get flanked or assist with the attack. If you see multiple players against you, it's time to back off. Just don't fall back all the way to your base. They don't know what you have, so you have to be on the edge of the vision and try to look scary. It will give the time for your team to come with the rescue or counter attack in other parts of the map. Also, make sure to communicate to your team that you need help and most importantly, don't say that the game is lost just because you are getting pushed. It's also very important to keep an eye on your commander, as he can be a double-edged sword. Commanders go in a huge explosion. If enemies manage to blow up your commander in the middle of your defenses, then you'll be in a world of pain. At some point, especially when higher tier units start to show up, it might be wise to send commander back to the base just to be safe. Or just build up some excess energy, cloak your comm and suicide him in the middle of enemy lines. It's called the comm bomb and it's a very strong opening for an attack. Just make sure that he will be able to reclaim or resurrect his wreck because he leaves a huge amount of metal behind. Also remember that the commander is not stealthy. You can go invisible, but you will still appear on the radar. Alright, there are more various topics which I wanted to talk about, so I will just go over them in no particular order. Let's start with advanced ways of controlling your units. Most of the time, you just want to move past enemies and your units will shoot along the way. It's always a good idea to slightly spread out your army so they don't block each other and they won't be destroyed by a single D-gun. You can achieve it by drawing the formation by holding the right click. You can drag many other commands. For example with attack, you can drag with right click to make each of your units shoot at a different point on the ground. It's pretty useful to cover an area with fire if you know that enemies are there but you have no vision of them. Or you can drag with a left click to make a circle. Your units will try to attack enemies in marked area. There is also a fight command which will make your unit stop moving when it will have a target in range. It's very useful for long range units. Some of the units like artillery and bombers also have a rear attack. It will make them attack random spots in marked circle. The last one I wanted to mention is set target. It makes your unit prioritize marked enemies if they are in range. It's extremely strong as it allows you to attack high value targets which hide behind other units. You can also change the movement behavior of your units. By default they stay where you put them, but you can make them find their target on their own. It's not the best idea with the offensive units as they will probably just get themselves killed, but it's very useful on Lazarus. What I like to do is to set them to roam and enable repeat. Then I issue them a fight command around my units. It will make them seek out targets to repair or reclaim on their own. It's very useful because then you just have to control your offensive units and the rest bots do their job without additional input. Now more about sharing resources and units. In the bottom right at the list of the players you can see the resources of your team and free buttons. They allow you to share units, metal and energy. If you click the resource button near your name, you will ping your team that you need it. So if you stole on energy, just click the energy button to ask for it. You can send resources to allies by dragging on the resource buttons. You can also give them the currently selected unit by double clicking on the double arrow button. It's a very important mechanic because it means that only one player has to rush the tier to lab and he can build the advanced constructors for the whole team. That's what your teammates mean when they talk about buying or selling T2. T2 constructor costs over 400 metal, so you should send it if someone tells you to pay for it. Getting the constructor allows you to upgrade your economy to the next tier and you should always do that before building the T2 lap yourself. 
Of course sometimes no one wants to share it and you will have to do it all yourself, but not sharing puts the whole team at huge disadvantage. I guess that's a good moment to talk about upgrading to tier 2. In general, you should buy your T2 constructor, then upgrade your starting maxes to advanced and finally build a fusion reactor. Then you can build the T2 lab and start producing advanced units. It makes it very smooth and safe. Just make sure that you have some army to defend yourself during the transition. You might have to reclaim the T1 lab during the process, but you should rebuild it afterwards. You have to support your expensive units with constant stream of ticks or pawns. It's commonly referred as spam and its purpose is to inflict constant pressure on enemy lines. It will give you vision and will force enemy hard hitters to waste their shots on worthless targets. If you try to push without the cover of the spam, you risk taking high casualties as you will be pushing in blindly. You could also walk into a cloaked commander which would just degun or homebomb your whole army. Let's talk about the late game economy now. Advanced fusion reactor or AFUS is the best energy source in the game. It can power up 4 advanced energy converters with some spare energy left. It means that one AFUS gives you 40 metal income. Advanced fusion is very expensive, so building the first one can take a few minutes. Building it too quickly is a common mistake, especially if you are not in the backline. Few minutes is plenty of time for your enemies to build up an army and roll through the front line. In general, the closer you are to the front, the smoother transitions you should make. And by smoother, I mean building regular fusions instead. If you take a look at late game base of Backliner, you will notice that it's all AFUSes, advanced energy converters and construction turrets. Everything else is reclaimed because there is no point in keeping early economy buildings, they are just inefficient. When you start building your own late game base, there are two key things that you should remember. Firstly, when AFUS blows up, it takes your whole base with it, and possibly also the bases of your neighbors. Basically, it's a game over for you. Because of that, you have to keep your AFUS safe. Thankfully, it's somewhat tanky. There comes the second point, which I already mentioned earlier. Energy converters explode and they are not tanky at all. You should never, ever, at any circumstances, build energy converters next to your AFUS. Two rows of energy converters will take 60% of AFUS HP when destroyed, making it a much easier target. Just build AFUSes on one side of construction turrets and energy converters on the other side. That's also a good time to remind you, do not ever build construction turrets. I saw new players who built 30 construction turrets first and then started an AFUS telling on the resources all the way. I guess just because they saw that other backliners have a lot of controls too. 30 turrets cost more than half of the price of the AFUS, just don't do it. 5 or 6 is enough to get started and you should have them anyway since the T2 transition. If you see that you are not spending metal fast enough, then add 1 or 2, not 20. After AFUS is finished, then you can build additional turrets. Remember, it's better to overproduce resources and then spend it on build power when you notice the issue, than spend it all on the build power and stall on everything else. If you see that you are overflowing metal, the first thing you should do is to build the metal storage as an immediate band-aid. Next you add build power by adding a few contours until you see that you are spending your metal. If you found yourself needing another metal storage, then your build power was probably way too low. The point I'm trying to make is that, in my opinion as a beginner, it's better to overproduce resources than overproduce the build power. Because if you have the resources, you can easily fix the build power issue. Alright, now the quick word about T3 units. You produce them in an experimental gantry which you can build with the T2 constructor. They are pretty expensive, but you can build the cheapest ones even with one AFUS worth of economy. Note that it means that you can do it with three fusions which makes for a pretty slick transition even for the front line. If you manage to secure big amounts of metal early on, you can rush one or two razor bags, which with support can completely wreck enemies. However, it takes experience to know when you can pull it off, just saying that is an option even for the frontline player. Ok, next topic is accuracy of the radar. 
T2 constructor can build pin pointers. Each pin pointer reduces the wobble of radar dots. With three of them, the dots are almost 100% accurate. Pin pointers work globally, so you need only three of them across the whole team. Next is what to do if your base got blown up. If you are left with nothing, ask for a constructor to be able to rebuild. If it's late game, someone might even give you a fusion and converter to get you started quickly. Rebuild somewhere in the back, nowhere near the front line. You don't want to get blown up again in one minute. My advice is to go for the bot lab and make a lot of res bots. You will be able to reclaim or resurrect what you need. Just make sure to build the metal storage. If you can reclaim around 10,000 metal, then go straight for the AFUS. If not, then try to get a fusion. If you have AFUS, then add energy converters and second or even third AFUS. Then go for T3 units or air or just build defenses for your backliners. If you didn't manage to get an AFUS, then just start spamming T1 units. Or just build defenses around your backline. They will have a much easier time carrying the game if they won't have to worry about defending their bases. I guess when we are talking about the late game, I should mention the nukes. You should have an anti-nuke covering your base 12 or 13 minutes into the game. You can build it with T2 constructor and usually you should get it after your first fusion. There is also a mobile version which you can get in T2 Factory. You should get it as a frontliner to cover your defensive line. It's also important to have an intrusion countermeasure system, which you can also build with T2 con. It will mark invisible units which try to sneak past your lines. The invisible spy bot, which you can build in T2 bot lab, can self destruct to stun everything around it. The common tactic is to sneak one of these into an enemy base, stun the anti nuke, and nuke the base. You need the countermeasures to prevent that from happening. The stun is called EMP. There are a few units which can EMP enemy, the most common ones are air drones from Cortex and EMP bombers from Armada. They can easily stop your push, so you should bring a few anti-air units if you plan to go deep into enemy territory. Next topic, terrain deformation. Big explosions leave craters in the ground. Enough of this might make a hole big enough that units won't be able to pass. Constructors have restore order which can fix the ground to the original state. It's important on maps with lava because lava pools which fill up the craters will destroy your units. Fun fact, on the supreme strait you can connect both seas with only a few nukes. Now a bit about communicating with the team. You can ping by holding tilde and clicking with the middle mouse button. You can draw on the map with your left click while you hold the tilde. You can also leave pings with a text message. Just point at the location with the cursor, double press tilde, type the message and press enter. You can clear the messages and drawings with the button in the bottom right of the screen. And you can switch between allied and everyone chat with alt plus enter. If you want to practice something, you can easily test things against AI in the skirmish. Just add an inactive AI and use these commands. I will put them in the description. They will make everything free and will allow you to control AI so you can set up and test any scenario you want. Another gateway of improving is watching replays. I tend to rewatch most of my games from enemy's perspective to see how it looked on the other side. It allows you to notice moments when you could successfully push or scale your economy without punishment. Also, if the enemy played better than you, just copy what he did next time. Keep in mind that all of the replays are available online on the Beyond Horizon website. You can find the replays of high level players and watch them if you want. You can also join official Discord and check out the Academy chat. There are dedicated mentors which will review your replays and give you tips on how to improve. I submitted mine a few times and they helped a lot, so I encourage you to try it out. If you join the Discord, you should also check out the widget section. Beyond the Reason is open source and there is a lot of useful add-ons which improve your experience. I won't explain how to install them, as there is already an instruction on the Discord. The list of widgets I use will be in the description. And that's everything I wanted to share. 
It's the longest video I ever made, but I feel like having everything in one place just makes sense. I hope I didn't forget anything important, but if I did, then just ask in the comments. Make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you found this video useful. Thank you for watching and see you next time.